Today at Jensen Beach High School, there is heightened security. Martin County Sheriff's Office and K-9 officers on campus and on alert. After a student found this, a threatening note by an unknown person that reads, note to self, on September 8th, bring a gun to school. Nine people were listed as intended targets. Today is September 8th and the Sheriff's Office has no idea who's behind this hit list. Parents are not taking any chances. I was really shocked. It, it was very jarring, very jarring, and I wanted to just pick her up right away. Kimberly Pierre's 15-year-old daughter attends Jensen Beach High School. Today, she's staying home. And as a parent, like, I don't want to think like, okay, what did you get through the first period? Did you get through the second period? You know, like, it's a... Uh, it's fear that we have just have. Last night, this text alert went out. The principal reassured parents that plans are in place and students are safe. I don't think anything's really going to happen. I think it's just all a scare. Today, deputies circled the campus, driving through the front entrance and throughout the parking lot. We take safety and security very, very seriously here in the Martin County School District, but we want parents to know that if there is something, that if there's an unfortunate situation, that takes place, we are prepared. Over the past year, the school district has doubled the number of armed school officers and more cameras were installed. Today at Jensen Beach High School, classroom doors are locked and the crisis alert system, which can be activated by the push of a badge, is on standby. If every employee is issued a badge that they carry with them at all times where they can call for a lockout or a lockdown. Now the district is urging parents, students, and staff to say something if you see something. That, that shouldn't even be a thought. That it's awful that it's a thought. We got a little wake-up call from our distributor who said our supply chain is going to get dicey. Look at what's happening and prepare yourselves. In Okeechobee County, the school district is trying to stock up. We've got number 10 cans of products, and those are the things that we are having a difficult time getting as well. The stockpile of cafeteria food is running low as the worsening supply chain problems across the U.S. makes itself felt in our school cafeterias. And when food delivery trucks do show up, there's no telling what's arriving. Local Okeechobee's video. food service supervisor Lisa Bell says chicken, beef and bread are now hard to come by. Last week we did not get 75 cases of hamburger buns. The same supply chain snarls are also plaguing other school districts. In Martin County today, CBS 12 News was there when a shipment of food was a no-show. Here at J.B. Parker Elementary School, which feeds about 800 students, an order for dinner rolls didn't come in today, so a last-minute change was made, and now these are on the menu. When we place our order, they say, oh, we can't get it. It's not in stock. The Director of Food and Nutrition Services in Martin County says the major food vendor is pulling out. We were notified that U.S. Food, our main distributor, is stopping service on December 31st. Forcing the district to get creative while finding a new supplier. In emergencies, we've had to make runs to Sam's Club or even Publix. We were beginning to see some instances where we were not able to fulfill our menus, and that concerned us. We have to think on the fly, we have to think fast, we have to be creative, but the news continues to be that this is not going away, not getting better. For students who have come to expect the unexpected during this whirlwind of a school year, cafeteria staff are working hard to give them something to look forward to at lunchtime. I want them to say, I love school lunch the best. You know, we're working with it, you know, and uh, we're doing a great job. And Stewart, Denise Sawyer, CBS 12 News. A retired teacher makes a comeback in the midst of COVID-19 to help Martin County students who need it the most. Yeah, CBS 12's Denise Sawyer shares the heartwarming tale of a teacher's lifelong dedication to children despite the pandemic. 36 years ago, I started at Parker. Walk the halls with Susan Torres and you will quickly see just how popular she is. And the kids love working with her. Torres was a fifth grade teacher at J.D. Parker Elementary School for more than 20 years. And now she's retired. Well, sort of. <laughs> well, yes, I retired 11 years ago. I, I knew when I retired that I could not be at home 
five days a week. So she's back at it, teaching fifth graders math, science, and reading. And get this, she's doing it for free. No salary, no paycheck, just helping out as a volunteer teacher's aide. Tuesday through Friday, three and a half hours a day. Not Mondays. I said when I retired, I would not work on a Monday at all. I want it. Torres is making sure other educators like Dorothy Castillo make it through this tough year of teaching in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. She's made my job so much easier this year because I've got kids who need the help. I can't do it all. I can't. We worked it out so that I could come and volunteer in her room, kind of pay her back for what she had done for me 30 years ago. These two have history. 30 years ago, Castillo was Torres's assistant, and now with the help of Zoom and virtual classes, Torres is hers. She is part of J.D. Parker. She is part of my family also. You know, we all love her. I'd be lost without her. I really would. Her unwavering support, even in the midst of unprecedented times, makes Susan Torres a hometown hero. Just thinking about all the years, this is where I'm comfortable. This is what I enjoy doing. It's just a good feeling. I've accomplished something that day. And Stewart, Denise Sawyer, CBS 12 News. Jason Farrell is a fourth generation Okeechobee resident. He's the owner of Ecotourism Airboat Rides. Some say lake water runs in his blood. Locally, it's how we make a living. In a remote section of Lake Okeechobee, hidden within the tall sawgrass. The water you'll see here is clear when we get up the creek. Jason takes us through the murky waters to a storm water treatment area where the water is surprisingly clear and the fish are plentiful. The kind of thing you don't often see in Lake Okeechobee. I wanted to take people out there and let them understand what this environment was all about. If I could send them home with a little bit of knowledge. In recent years, the lake's health has has worsened. Researchers say it's been poisoned by excessive nutrients from fertilizer and septic runoff, choking the oxygen out of the water, killing fish and leading to toxic blue-green algae. According to South Florida Water Management, tons of phosphorus finds its way into Lake Okeechobee each year. Oh, you'll see it's already starting to get clogged back up. So to protect these ecosystems and push for better water quality, Jason is taking people out on his airboat to educate them about the once pristine lake. Well, if I don't do something now, it's not going to be here at the tail end of my life or it's not going to be here for my kids. Jason believes more stormwater treatment areas would do the trick by filtering out the phosphorus from the water. Okeechobee County needs to come up with something to uh, treat their stormwater before it gets into the lake. Coastal cities, they need to address the septic tanks that are on the intercoastal. I believe that we all have to play a part, not just the farmers, not just the people around the lake. They need to know, while I've got a camera in front of me, that we're trying our best to do our part, but we're doing something that it may take more money than we can afford to do. Yeah, to create more stormwater treatment areas, it's pricey. Now, over the past 20 years, the state of Florida has invested $1.8 billion in phosphorus control programs, and scientists say they have seen an improvement in water quality. Reporting in Okeechobee, Denise Sawyer, CBS 12 News. Oh. In the heat of South Florida, with water around his ankles, on an island with no one else around, 34-year-old Andrew Otazo sets out on a mission. Pipe number four. He dives to the depths of the ocean bottom and goes deep into the mangroves to collect nearly 14,000 pounds of trash in 100 days. From sunup to sundown, Andrew is hauling trash, all sorts of it, because he refuses to sit by and watch as pollution worsens. It used to be frustration and anger. Now it's just like, okay, what do I need to do in order to clean this area up? So for 100 days, he put in the work, properly getting rid of fishing nets, large plastic pipes, and even this, documenting everything and posting it to social media. I would wake up at like 5.30 a.m. before the sun rises, where I just go 
for hours and time flies by. It was so much trash that at times his industrial bags were not enough, but he kept moving, making multiple trips to get the job done. For the first time ever, I found a message in a bottle. Finding treasures along the way. I want them to think I'm crazy and I want them to take a look at my work and say to themselves, okay, for every piece of trash that I pick up, there's a chance that there's an animal out there who's alive that wouldn't otherwise be. So a little bit more beauty in the world than there would otherwise be. And as his loads of trash grew, so did his reach. Those who were inspired by him grabbed their own buckets to join in on a mission to get rid of unwanted waste. Clean up today and it was how much? 148. 148. Good job, everybody. Denise Sawyer, CBS 12 News. Hopefully it's contagious. Atazo tells Denise he plans to take his trash picking passion north of Palm Beach County and possibly across the state. The U.S. economy picks itself up from this downward spiral caused by the pandemic. A local theater in Fort Pierce is in a slow recovery stage and now city commissioners are faced with a challenging decision. It had been a movie theater when I was young and it had been a theater since 1923. Not many places you go to have somewhere like this. And it had live entertainment, vaudeville, that kind of thing. On August 1st, 1923, Sunrise opened its doors as the largest theater on Florida's East Coast, a one of a kind between Jacksonville and Miami. So it's been a staple in Fort Pierce. We give it a lot of credit because it was one of the first things that really made downtown come back to life. But the pandemic happened and the music stop and productions came to a halt. Mayor Linda Hudson says the once thriving and economic engine for downtown Fort Pierce has lost its steam. It took a bad fiscal beating this past year when the pandemic forced Sunrise Theater to close its doors for nine months. Now city commissioners have stepped in to save this city subsidized theater. Last night they voted to pour $500,000 into it. But will it be enough? That's the $500,000 question. I, I don't know that. It's a business like anything else, and all businesses have been hit hard. And as a result, all businesses have had to make some tough decisions. There's a pandemic relief grant available at the federal level, but there's concern that the theater may not survive the pandemic. If the Sunrise Theater shut down, it's going to hurt a lot of people down here, too. Because people look forward to coming to the Sunrise Theater. They get dressed up. That's one of the only places in Fort Pierce that can come down here and get dressed up and feel like be part of something. City leaders say that's not happening. They're working to make sure this important piece of Fort Pierce history remains at the heart of the downtown community. Now the mayor and commissioners will discuss the future of this theater at a March 23rd meeting. There is talks of bringing an outside management company to take over. In Fort Pierce, I'm Denise Sawyer for CBS 12 News.